the office of the deputy headmistress was clean and well organized. Mr. Potter, what is this about? Harry's mind went blank. He'd been instructed by the game to come here. He had been expecting her to have something in mind. Thankfully, Harry's panicking brain remembered at this point that he did have something he'd been planning to discuss with Professor McGonagall. Something important and well worth her time. It was at this point that Harry realized he was faced with a priceless and possibly irreplaceable opportunity to offer Professor McGonagall a comedy, and he couldn't believe he was seriously thinking that. It's about the incident with the sorting hat. Um, I think there's an extra spell on the sorting hat. Something that the sorting hat itself doesn't know about. Something that triggers when the sorting hat says Slytherin. I heard a message that I'm pretty sure Ravenclaws aren't supposed to hear. It came the moment the sorting hat was off my head, and it said, Salutations from Slytherin to Slytherin. If you would seek my secrets, speak to my snake. So, you decided to come here to me right away and tell me about it. And if, say, you were to discover the entrance to Salazar Slytherin's legendary Chamber of Secrets, an entrance that you and you alone could open... It's obvious if you're not a Gryffindor. I would close the entrance and report to you at once so that a team of experienced magical archaeologists could be assembled. I think that you far underestimate the rarity of common sense, Mr. Potter. A Hufflepuff would have said the same thing. That's true. Sorting Hat offered me Hufflepuff. Did it really? Yes. Mr. Potter, five decades ago was the last time a student died within the walls of Hogwarts. And I am now certain that five decades ago was the last time someone heard that message. A chill went through Harry. Then I will be very sure to take no action whatsoever on this matter without consulting you, Professor McGonagall. And may I suggest that you get together the best people you can and see if it's possible to get that extra spell off the sorting hat. I cannot possibly award you enough points for this without giving the house cup to Ravenclaw outright. Um, I'd rather not earn that many house points. I'm fine with earning lots of points, more than anyone else even. But if I earn enough to be decisive in winning the House Cup just by myself, then it's like I'm carrying House Ravenclaw on my back, and that's too sad. I see why the Sorting Hat offered you Hufflepuff. That made Harry choke up a bit. He'd honestly thought he wasn't worthy of Hufflepuff, that the Sorting Hat had just been trying to shove him anywhere but Ravenclaw, into a house whose virtues he didn't have. I see that I have greatly wronged you in my thoughts, Mr. Potter. But I do have a very special something else I can give you. Professor McGonagall held out in one hand a necklace, a thin golden chain bearing in its center a silver circle within which was the device of an hourglass. Mr. Potter, this is an item which is ordinarily lent only to children who have already shown themselves to be highly responsible in order to help them with difficult class schedules. I must emphasize, Mr. Potter, that this item's true nature is a secret and that you must not tell any of the other students about it, or let them see you use it. I can keep secrets. And what does it really do? It is a time turner. Each spin of the hourglass sends you back one hour in time. So if you use it to go back two hours every day, you should always be able to get to sleep at the same time. Harry's suspension of disbelief blew completely out the window. You're giving me a time machine to treat my sleep disorder. You're giving me a time machine to treat my sleep disorder. You're giving me a time machine in order to treat my sleep disorder? He was now holding the necklace away from him as though it were a live bomb. Well, no, not as if it were a live bomb. That didn't begin to describe the severity of the situation. Harry held the necklace away from him as though it were a time machine. Excuse me, but this sounds really... Really, really, really dangerous! I'm glad you're taking this seriously, Mr. Potter. But time turners aren't that dangerous. We wouldn't give them to children if they were. Really? <laughs> of course you wouldn't give time machines to children if they were dangerous. What was I thinking? So, just to be clear, Sneezing on this device will not send me into the Middle Ages, where I will run over Gutenberg with a horse cart and prevent the Enlightenment? Because, you know, I hate it when that happens to me. Oh, you can't change time. Good heavens, Mr. Potter. Do you think these would be allowed students if that was possible? What if someone tried to change their test scores? 
The time turner cannot be used to move more than six hours backward. It can't be used more than six times in any day. His hands relaxed just a little from their white grip on the hourglass chain. Like he wasn't holding a time machine, just a live nuclear warhead. So, people just find that the universe happens to be self-consistent, somehow, even though it has time travel in it? If I and my future self interact, then I'll see the same thing as both of me, even though on my own first run through, my future self is already acting in full knowledge of things that, from my own perspective, haven't happened yet. You're having another you-just-turned-into-a-cat moment, aren't you, Mr. Potter? You probably don't want to hear this, but it's quite endearingly cute. Turning into a cat doesn't even begin to compare to this! You know, right up until this moment, I had this awful suppressed thought somewhere in the back of my mind that the only remaining answer was that my whole universe was a computer simulation, like in the book Simulcon 3. But now, even that is ruled out because this little toy isn't Turing computable! A Turing machine could simulate going back into a defined moment of the past and computing a different future from there? An Oracle machine could rely on the halting behavior of lower order machines, but what you're saying is that reality somehow self-consistently computes in one sweep using information that hasn't happened yet. Realization struck Harry a pile driver blow. So that's how the Comet T works. Of course, the spell doesn't force funny events to happen. It just makes you feel an impulse to drink right before funny things are going to happen anyway. I'm such a fool. I should have realized when I felt the impulse to drink the comet tea before Dumbledore's second speech, didn't drink it, and then choked on my own saliva instead. Drinking the comet tea doesn't cause the comedy. The comedy causes you to drink the comet tea. I saw the two events were correlated and assumed the comet tea had to be the cause and the comedy had to be the effect because I thought temporal order restrained causation and causal graphs had to be acyclical. But it all makes sense once you draw the causal arrows going backwards in time. Realization struck Harry the second pile driver. This one he managed to keep quiet, making only a small strangling sound like a dying kitten as he realized who'd put the note on his bed this morning. And he had to admit that it had been an irreplaceable opportunity. A prank you could only pull on yourself once in a lifetime within six hours of when you first found out about time turners. In fact, that was even more puzzling when Harry thought about it. Time had presented him with the finished prank as a fait accompli, and yet it was, quite clearly, his own handiwork. Concept and execution and writing style. Even in retrospect, Harry didn't understand how he'd pulled off half the stuff involved in the prank. Where had the pie come from? Well, time was a-wastin', and there were at most 30 hours in a day. Harry did know some of what he had to do, and he might figure out the rest, like the pie, while he was working. There was no point putting it off. He couldn't exactly accomplish anything stuck here in the future. If not for the prank, he might well never have obtained a time-turner in the first place. Or would Professor McGonagall have given it to him anyway, only later in the day, whenever he got around to asking about a sleep disorder, or telling her about the Sorting Hat's message? And would he, at that time, have wanted to pull a prank on himself which would have led to him getting the time-turner earlier? so that the only self-consistent possibility was the one in which the prank started before he even woke up in the morning. Harry found himself considering, for the first time in his life, that the answer to his question might be literally inconceivable. Up until this point, Harry had lived by the admonition of E.T. Jaynes that if you were ignorant about a phenomenon, that was a fact about your own state of mind, not a fact about the phenomenon itself. A phenomenon could be mysterious to some particular person, but there could be no phenomenon mysterious of themselves. To worship a sacred mystery was just to worship your own ignorance. Every mystery ever solved had been a puzzle from the dawn of the human species right up until someone solved it. Now, for the first time, he was up against the prospect of a mystery that was threatening to be permanent. If time didn't work by acyclical causal networks, then Harry didn't understand what was meant by cause and effect. And if Harry didn't understand causes and effects, then he didn't understand what sort of stuff reality might be made of instead. And it was entirely possible that his human mind never could understand, because his brain was made of old-fashioned linear time neurons, and this had turned out to be an impoverished subset of reality. Five hours earlier, it seemed that everyone was asleep. 
And there also seemed to be a box, wrapped in red and green paper with a bright golden ribbon lying next to his bed. The perfect, stereotypical image of a Christmas present, although it wasn't Christmas. There was an envelope attached to the box, closed by a plain clear wax without a seal impressed. The letter said, This is the cloak of invisibility of Ignotus Peverell, passed down through his descendants, the Potters. Unlike lesser cloaks and spells, it has the power to keep you hidden, not merely invisible. Your father lent it to me to study shortly before he died, and I confess that I have received much good use of it over the years. In the future, I shall have to get along with disillusionment, I fear. It is time the cloak was returned to you, its heir. I had thought to make this a Christmas present, but it wished to come back to your hand before then. It seems to expect you to have need of it. Use it well. No doubt you are already thinking of all manner of wonderful pranks as your father committed in his day. If his full misdeeds were known, every woman in Gryffindor would gather to desecrate his grave. I shall not try to stop history from repeating, but be most careful not to reveal yourself. If Dumbledore saw a chance to possess one of the Deathly Hollows, he would never allow it to escape his grasp. A very Merry Christmas to you. The note was unsigned. Hold on! Sorry, there's something else I've got to do with my trunk. I'll be along to breakfast in a couple of minutes. You'd better not be planning to go through any of our things. I swear that I intend to do nothing of the sort to any of your things, that I only intend to access objects that I myself own, that I have no pranking or otherwise questionable intentions toward any of you, and that I do not anticipate those intentions changing before I get to breakfast in the Great Hall. Wait, is that... Don't worry, there were no loopholes. Well worded, Potter. You should be a lawyer. Thank you, I think. When you try to find the Great Hall, you will get lost. As soon as you do, ask a portrait how to get to the first floor. Ask another portrait the instant you suspect you might be lost again, especially if it seems like you're going up higher and higher. If you are higher than the whole castle ought to be, stop and wait for search parties. Otherwise, we shall see you again three months later and you will be two years older and dressed in a loincloth and covered in snow, and that's if you stay inside the castle. Um, shouldn't you tell students all that sort of stuff right away? What, all that stuff? That would take weeks. You'll have to pick it up as you go along. If I don't see you at breakfast in 30 minutes, Potter, I'll start the search. Once everyone was gone, Harry attached the note to his bed. Then, he pulled the Cloak of Invisibility off Harry One's still-sleeping form. And just for the sake of mischief, Harry put the cloak into Harry One's pouch, knowing it would thereby already be in his own. I can see that the message is passed on to Cornelius Flubberwalt, but might I ask where it came from originally? I was told that it was spoken by a hollow voice that belled forth from a gap within the air itself, a gap that opened upon a fiery abyss. Hey, that's everyone's dessert. You can't just take one whole pie and put it in your pouch. I'm not taking one pie. I'm taking two. Sorry, everyone. Gotta run now. Harry ignored the cries of outrage and left the Great Hall. He needed to arrive at herbology class a little early. And how do you know what the Slytherins are planning? I can't name my source. In fact, I have to ask you to pretend that this conversation never happened. Just act like you happened across them naturally while you were on an errand or something. I'll run on ahead as soon as herbology gets out. I think I can distract the Slytherins until you get there. Please be careful with yourself, Harry Potter. And thank you. Just be sure not to be late. And remember, when you get there, you weren't expecting to see me, and this conversation never happened. It was horrible watching himself. Neville had been right. Hello, I'm the boy who lived. Oh, did you want the widow books? First year boys, mostly the same height. One of them had a scar on his forehead, and he wasn't acting like the others. Oh, what some power the gift he gives. To see ourselves as others see us. It would free money a blunder free us, and foolish notion. Professor McGonagall was right. The sorting hat was right. It was clear once you saw it from the outside. There was something wrong with Harry Potter.